Hello, Night Nation. Trace Relco here. Welcome into the Sons of UCF Live. UCF Mike remains on assignment. Joining me this week, Adam. Greetings, Adam. Hello, Trace. Happy Thursday. Happy opening softball day. I wish I could watch it along with all of you, but uh, somebody pulled the plug at ESPN+. Plus. <laughs> Yeah, some technical difficulties out at the Plex. Can't tell you, middle of fifth, UCF with a 2-1 lead. It's a top 20 matchup with the Knights uh, 15th in one poll, 18th in another, Georgia 10th. That was how it was in the notes. So uh, UCF going into the bottom of the fifth with a 2-1 lead. The uh, Washington transfer, uh, Sarah Willis, uh, got the start in the circle. Three innings pitched for her. Uh, she uh, Gave up two hits and earned runs. So Knights leading. We'll check back in with them throughout the uh, the hour. But some breaking news right before uh, we came on. I guess those dreams of seeing Texas in the bounce house uh, next season are going away. Yeah, uh, SI's Ross Dellinger reporting that Texas and OU have struck a deal to leave the Big 12 and join the SEC formally in 2024. Um, there was some contractual stuff with networks, ESPN, Fox specifically, that had to be worked out. Sounds like that hurdle's been crossed. They will pay a $100 million exit fee, of which will be split amongst the eight legacy schools, which means UCF, Houston, Cincinnati, BYU will not see a dime of that money. And that means this will be the only year we will get an opportunity to play those two schools. So for those of us holding out hope in 24, we would get Texas or Oklahoma at home. Sounds like that is not going to happen. They will be leaving at the end of this year. So, Trace, one and done for UCF with Texas and Oklahoma in the Big 12. Chris Vanini of The Athletic posting on Twitter. He'll always remember the year that UCF and Texas shared the Big 12 together. Of course, uh, UCF and Texas opened the bounce house. Uh, Knights fans expecting, hoping uh, that they'd see Texas return of Texas and Oklahoma only going to Oklahoma is on the schedule for the Knights. What do you think of that? The money going to the uh, the leftover eight. I mean, I, I guess in, in theory, right, they're breaking that contract they signed with those schools. So, I, I mean, it makes some sense. You would love to see an opportunity for some of the new four schools to be able to, to reap the rewards on that. Even though now we're going into the same conference, we're already on an uneven playing field and we're not getting full shares for a couple seasons. And that continues. So, it feels like that keeps us a little bit behind the uh, uh, the – I guess the leftover eight, if you call them that, but this was a foregone conclusion. We all knew that this was going to happen at some point, that there were going to be people who work out negotiations and deals to get them out of the conference. It's clear the big 12 did not want them there as they move forward in the next evolution. It's clear. Obviously they wanted out. They want to get the sec ESPN has the sec. So they had every incentive in the world to get them there as fast as possible to value up that TV deal. So this seemed like a, a foregone conclusion. I just find it interesting that it seemed like, <laughs> The Big 12 and your mark were waiting a little bit to reduce the schedule because they think they felt like, hey, this may be a one year thing. And they released the schedule. And here we are, you know, nine days later and this comes out. So you, you wonder how the timing worked out on that. But it's a bummer. I would have loved to have the opportunity to have one of them come to the bounce house. Um, and at the time we were OK with the schedule because we thought we had one more year with them. Now eh, it doesn't look so much so much like fun for us. Well, of course, new Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark has been aggressive, uh, skipping or jumping rather the Pac-10 uh, and uh, inking that TV contract uh, extensions and all of that. And now, of course, rumors that uh, Pac-10 may be going. Is it Pac-10 or 12? Is it 10 or 12? Is it 10 right now? I think it's 12. 12. Ten. Pac-12. Pac-12. Uh, like <laughs> SMU and San Diego State. Um Ooh, I course, smell a Brett bender Yormark. when I see one, Trace. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> well, and that's just going to heat up the talk, right, of uh, the Big 12 going after Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State, you know, that Utah, that mix of teams there. Uh, I like San Diego State in the mix uh, for the pack, but uh, SMU, geez, uh, I don't know what they uh, what they bring to their league with that. I mean, assume it's expansion into Texas, right? The further you can get a little bit, uh, a little bit east, I guess, for the Pac-12. Must be Pac-12. Um, the further east you can get for the Pac-12, I think the better, or at least they assume the better. I, I don't know. That's a foregone conclusion. I think there's some cultural challenges that have to be kind of worked out between SMU getting into the uh, into the the Pac conference. Um, so I'm not sure that's a foregone conclusion. But my how we've gone from boy the you know the Stuart Mandels of the world were lecturing all of us every day about <laughs> how powerful the Pac-12 was and they don't have to worry about anything. And lo and behold, now they're you know they're they're begging SMU to, to think about a uh, an invitation. So my how the uh, the mighty have fallen, Trace. Again, I smell a, I smell a bender here. I smell a bender by uh, Kalivakov, the uh, the conference commissioner of the Pac-12. 
Well, a lot of money in Dallas, uh, but not a very deep fan base. Uh, so yeah. not a lot of interest in SMU football. And they've had success, uh, certainly, over the last couple of years. I didn't see the uh, PAC commissioner in Tampa checking out anything. Uh, he was in Dallas last night for the SMU basketball. He went to South Florida and got confused. And so he turned around <laughs> and went back home, Trace. Yeah, I mean, they're already, uh, you know, uh, in fits that UCF is making that move to the Big 12. And they see SMU possibly going. Uh, at, at San Diego State. So uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, some football news this week. Slow time of the year, of course. Uh, UCF announcing Will Healy, senior offensive analyst and advisor and head coach Gus Malzahn. He, of course, uh, had coaching experience at Charlotte and before that Austin P. So an interesting addition by Coach Malzahn to the staff. Yeah, obviously, uh, uh, a young and up-and-coming coach. We all saw him at UCF in 2017. He brought his Austin P team into uh, into the bounce house and kind of a reschedule game, and we won that one. 73-33, according to the picture on my wall behind me there. Uh, in a game that they, they were they were in that game, even though we won by 50. I mean, that was an interesting, weird game, if everyone recalls that one. He was a hot coaching hire, went to Charlotte. Um, things didn't really work out there. 28-45 in his career, regarded as a young offensive mind. And, Andres, I love that he's bringing him in. Obviously, we have a new OC in, in Darren Hinshaw, getting more smart people in the room to, to uh, con, you know conceptually put up offense, particularly if Gus is going to give up play calling and allow some of that to be – um, be handed over. I mean, more smart people in the room never hurt. And of course, Coach Malzahn likes to give opportunities to guys. Uh, you've seen that in his coaching tree throughout his career. So in addition to his staff coming just on the heels, of course, of uh, former Knight quarterback Darren Hinshaw being named offensive coordinator. Before we know it, you know, there's talk. It's not official yet, but looking like uh, spring camp may start March 20th. So about six weeks or so away. Uh, interesting to see what's happening there now. And of course, quarterback John Rice Plumley uh, moonlighting uh, at baseball. He was at Media Day last week, and uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that develops. But uh, in addition to Coach Malzahn's staff, and uh, uh, of course, the, uh, the party line from him is that uh, he's giving up play calling duties. So uh, I, I remain a bit skeptical of that, though. Yeah, there's a question in the mailbag. I don't want to spoil my answer. I think I think there's a catch to that foreshadowing uh, future <laughs> Sons of UCF content. Mm, that's quite the tease. That's quite Thank the you. tease. Also, uh, uh, some football news this week. Uh, long snapper Alex Ward, he was just in the Senior Bowl or participated in the practices, uh, and uh, now the only long snapper in the nation invited to the NFL Combine. Do you think he becomes the only UCF player off this 22 roster that gets drafted? Yes. So you think he's a maybe a, a five, six, seven guy? I do. I think he'll get drafted. I think long snapping is such a unique role in the NFL. When you find a good one, you don't want to let it go. Uh, I think he's going to show some talent out there. He's he's obviously going to be a little cheaper and then than some of the maybe more um, seasoned long snappers out there. And teams always want to save money in that salary cap. So I think you know he was the um, the American um, team at the Senior Bowl. He was the American team's special teams MVP last week. So clearly he's gotten himself in front of a lot of the scouts. He's going to get more reps in here at the Senior Bowl. I think a team will take a flyer on him in that sixth, seventh round and say, hey, you know what? We're not sure about our long snappers. Someone's retiring, whatever. Um, those guys, Charlie Hewlett from UCF is a huge example of that. He's been in the league almost 10 years now um, on long snapping alone. Um, and you don't know the long snapper's name until they're not there anymore. I think Alex Ward will, will make a roster and make a team. And I think he'll be a cornerstone 10-year NFL player. I mean, if you can keep snapping accurately, I mean, you're, you're going to find a space, a trace. And I don't know if you saw the Pro Bowl games, widely, highly rated, by the way. They played kick Tack toe. I did not. Watch the, oh, Trace. I mean, I'll have to get you a video. Kick no. tack toe, where the specialists had to basically play tic tac toe, and the long snappers actually were the uh, the stars of that particular event. So I think Alex Ward, future kick tack toe star. <laughs> UCF was okay. wide receiver. You. It's now long snapper. You. Kick tack toe. Say that five yeah. times fast. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not going to say that uh, okay. fast. You know when the. Um, Big 12 schedule came out and we broke down the games. And I'll tell you what, a lot of the destinations have been eye openers for Night Nation. We knew the teams in this league, minus, of course, Texas and Oklahoma, whatever they're talking about doing, right? Uh, but I think it still came as a shock to some fans. And there was a lot of, where the heck is Lubbock? So I decided this week to reach out to uh, visit Lubbock. And uh, we're joined now by the CEO of Visit Lubbock, Lubbock John Osborne. John, welcome into Sons of UCF Live. Hey, thanks for having me. I Apologize for all the commotion around me. We are in playoff basketball mode right now, and 
So we're having a lot of fun uh, uh, watching the, uh, one of our, a couple of our local teams play. Your work is never done. You're just there as a fan supporting Lubbock, or do you have someone in the game? So uh, my son uh, is a senior on the boys' team, but we're actually watching the girls' game tonight, just supporting them and, and uh, having a great time. I mean, there's a lot of stereotypes about Texans. Uh, one is that we love our sports, and uh, that one is absolutely true. Well, good. I'm glad you're here to uh, help us dispel uh, some of those stereotypes that fans in Night Nation may have about Texas and Lubbock. Knights travel to Texas Tech on Saturday, November 18th. Uh, first question for you, what is game day like for the Red Raider Nation? It's really fun. So uh, obviously we'll have a game either at 11 o'clock or maybe 2 o'clock, uh, sometimes 6 o'clock or even you know later, 7.30 in the evening. Um, but um, – but it's always fun. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. We have uh, great tailgating that goes on. Um, we're, you know, there's the fans are very passionate about the, our, our university and our Red Raiders. And so um, I can't necessarily say that your fans will be welcome in our tailgates, but they won't be <laughs> unwelcome necessarily. Uh, but it's fun. It's a, it's a great environment. There's a lot of parade um, uh, that, takes, uh, that goes on um, in um, uh, the Raider Alley. And uh, the band, the going band from Raiderland uh, is playing and coming, coming into the stadium. Once you get into the stadium, there's a lot of uh, fun activities that are taking place there as well. Well, we're familiar here, not being very far away from Gainesville and home to the University of Florida, that that is a college town. Do you describe Lubbock as a college town or do you look at it as more than that? You know, we, we have. We've, we've described uh, Lubbock as a college town for decades and um, we still are that way. But uh, we're not just a town of, say, 25,000 people. We're actually more than 250,000 people. And we are the largest uh, city between um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area and Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is about a 600-mile stretch. It's a pretty, pretty far area. Uh, we're known as the hub city because of all of the activities that take place in our community, the, the roads that come in and out, the retail, the education, the health care. And, um, and so, hey, guys, guys, shh. <laughs> I'm, still sorry. I'm really apologize. You're fine. It's hard to think, yeah, at a basketball game here. <laughs> so anyhow, it's uh, it's a it's a fun college town. Uh, we actually have multiple universities here. Obviously, Texas Tech University is our largest university, but because of all those universities, it very much has a college vibe to it. Um, there's a lot of fun uh, places to go and eat and um, celebrate, and uh, um, we've got some great hotels that are here. So we we get uh, good travel uh, from our fan base um, whenever they've uh, left and, and the alumni have gone to Dallas Fort Worth or Houston or some other place in the country uh, they like to come back to our to, to Lubbock and they love um, coming in and they're greeted really well when they come John tell me a little bit about um, the the life around Texas Tech so if I get to town on a Friday night the game's on a Saturday what kind of trouble can I get into on Friday night what are the fun <laughs> things I can check out when I'm perusing around Lubbock yeah, so uh, there's obviously there's the college bar scene, which is just across the street from the university uh, in kind of the Broadway area, uh, which is the main strip between downtown and the university. There's also uh, quite a bit of activity going on in the Overton District, which is just north of that little area right next to the university as well. Um, if you want to kind of stay away from the from that college area, which can get a little rowdy, especially with all the, the students and how passionate they are. Uh, we've got um, uh, quite a few different commercial areas with some great restaurants, uh, everything from kind of um, craft brews and, and uh, uh, great wines uh, that are made here uh, in the region, uh, as well as uh, some, uh, some places where you can enjoy a nice whiskey as well. You mentioned that a few times now. So if I walk through the, the college area wearing a UCF shirt, will I be safe? Do I need to have protection <laughs> and, and multiple bodyguards with me? So it really depends on your fan base. Um, the, the, we, you know, we've got some fan bases in Texas that are pretty big rivals of ours. And um, we find that they can be pretty unruly. And so as a result, there's a little bit of unruliness that kind of comes back. Uh, but what we found is that uh, we greatly appreciate the fan bases that do travel here. Um, we are passionate about our Red Raiders. Um, you should be safe. Um, we, we can't imagine why there would be anything but a, a safe environment for you. But uh, I, I'll just say that our fan base is very, very passionate about, about our team. So don't run your mouth uh, when you're out mm -hmm. and about. A That's little right. go Knights is fine, but maybe don't take it further than that. That's right. That's right. And, you know, there's, 
there's definitely some sections where, um, you know, obviously the tickets are being sold uh, for the, the competition. And uh, we'd love it if you just sat over there. And so if, uh, if you kind of intermix with all the rest of us, then you, you may find that um, we remind you that there was a first down made or that, a, that we got a touchdown or that you had an incomplete pass or something along those lines. Uh, earlier, you mentioned craft beer. That's a big uh, favorite of mine. Talk a little bit more about that scene, please. Yeah, so, uh, you know, again, one of the things about Texas is that for the longest time, many of the counties in Texas were dry. And we were dry up until about 2009. Meaning really? That, yeah, they couldn't sell alcohol um, and, and unless you were going and, and kind of buying it for yourself. Uh, uh, the voters did vote and passed that. And as a result, our craft scene has really blossomed since then. So many of our breweries are relatively young. Uh, but we've got more and more that are developing. We've got quite a few in the downtown area. We've got some in what we call the Canyon Lakes area. And um, that's uh, uh, an area, you know, Lubbock is very flat, much like Orlando. And um, what you find is that when the water, when it rains, the water doesn't have much place to go. And so it starts to, over millions of years, kind of uh, create little crevices and canyons. And that little canyon area is a beautiful area. We've got some, some breweries that have popped up along that canyon area, uh, some coffee shops that have popped up along there. And then our downtown is in um, the early stages of revitalization right now over the last five, six years. It's really blossomed and there's some fun restaurants to go to. Um, but there's also some great um, uh, breweries that, uh, that um, the adults really enjoy going to. Um, some great uh, art galleries and, and um, fun, just a lot of fun activities in downtown. And it's only getting better every single year. What's the alcohol scene like on game day uh, at the stadium? Is that open to the general fan base or is that more club suite and, and that season ticket holder base? No, no, it's now both. They now sell uh, alcohol in the stadium. That's only actually been for the last couple of years. And um, uh, people have really liked it. it. It keeps them inside the stadium uh, as opposed to going back out to the car and tailgating for the second half. And that makes it a lot more fun. So um, yeah, definitely encourage your fans to uh, stay and watch the halftime show. The going band from Raiderland is really fun to watch. They're a great band and um, they've got, uh, a, uh, um, they do a really, really nice job of uh, pumping up the fan base. All right, John, I knew you were coming on. So I had to do some, um, some voracious research around mm -hmm. Lubbock. So I fell down a Lubbock rabbit hole. I'll be back <laughs> soon. I have a true or false for you. True or false. Buddy Holly is the Elvis of Lubbock. True or false. Boy, howdy. I, I don't know. I, I would say that Buddy Holly is the king of rock and roll before mm. Elvis. Um, he's really what started rock and roll. Uh, Elvis really, um, you know, made something of it. But uh, if, if you think about what Bo Buddy Holly did is he inspired so many. Um, it was his new form of music that actually inspired the Beatles to be um, to play the way that they did. And um, so many different bands have been um Really honored uh, Buddy Holly over the years for what he did to actually kind of start rock and roll. Um, it, you know, obviously uh, Elvis is the king, um, and that's, some of that's because he's from Memphis. But um, in, in reality, uh, Buddy Holly is what really what started rock and roll. And his uh, unfortunate short life, we could have enjoyed him so much longer um, had, had he not died in that plane crash. And he, he's revered in Lubbock. Yes, there are there are buildings and streets and whatnot commemorating Buddy Holly. Yeah, there's, uh, there are streets uh, that are named after him. There, we've got a statue uh, of him as well. Uh, there's a museum of him as well if you want to learn more about Buddy Holly. Um, but we've also just recently built um, a state-of-the-art, almost $60 million uh, performing arts center uh, um, in our downtown. And, and there's everything from Broadway shows and the ballet to the symphony that's there. And um, we get all kinds of concerts uh, that, that come and, and play there. And it's called the Buddy Holly Hall of Performing Arts and Sciences. Named after right. what, And that was actually you... done by a benefactor. A, a, a donation was made in his name, an anonymous donation. And um, that just shows uh, how important he is to our music history. What can you tell me about these Lubbock lights, John? This seems kind of shady right up on this thing. Hope everyone's okay, by the way. What can yeah. you tell me about the <laughs> Lubbock lights? That seems kind of shady. The the Lubbock lights. Um, I'm not, I guess I'm not following you. Uh, so I read about some sort of Lubbock light situation. There's some UFO sightings a few years back. Uh, people assume it wasn't UFOs. It was street lights in Lubbock. I, I need more details there. Do you have more for me yeah. there? 
So I really got nothing for you, and I'm not I'm not just throwing shade mm. to you, but in this neck of the woods, uh, we really think of Roswell, New Mexico, as having those lights. Um, that they're mm. really much more known, and they're a couple hours, maybe three hours uh, to the southwest of us uh, in New Mexico. That's really where, where you see a lot more uh, of that kind of activity. Over the summer, we had a guest on from uh, that covers Texas Tech uh, sports, and uh, he talked about prairie dog town. So yeah. I've got that circled. Uh, <laughs> describe that a little bit for us, because that's on my to-do list somewhere in with the craft breweries. So I can only imagine if that you were um, in Florida and digging, you'd probably um, hit a lot of water. Yeah. And that's really not the case out here in our dry area. In fact, I strongly suggest if you, your fan base is coming from uh, Orlando and all that you need to make sure they bring a, a big tube of chapstick because they're going to find our uh, arid climate is much drier. It's uh, a prairie land um, that we, and where Lubbock was founded and uh, where Texas Tech was established. And on that prairie is um, kind of a marmot looking thing called a prairie dog. And so uh, it's, it's, yeah, we have a prairie dog town and it, it's one of the most visited attractions. I'm not going to say it's anything like Disneyland by any stretch, but uh, <laughs> it, is, it is very fun to go to. So I should say Disney World. Uh, is that a daytime thing, dusk thing? When's yeah. the time to go? Yeah, it's definitely, uh, the prairie dogs will be out more during the day in the daylight hours. Um, there, the, you'll find that there's not any, you know, tall grass there. They, they stand up on their hind legs and, and look, and that's how they kind of make sure that there's no, nothing, um, you know, a predator that's coming or anything like that. Uh, there's a lot of people that, you know, take uh, loaves of bread out there and make sure the prairie dogs are staying fat or peanuts or something along those lines. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a short thing. It's, there's not, a, not a place to, to buy a loaf of bread right there next to it, but um, it's it's you need to do it once for sure. All right, John, what's with the tortillas? Why why are we throwing tortillas everywhere? Seems like a, a nice food product. Why we must be wasting them and throw them at people? Well, you know, tacos are a big thing in Texas, and we love um, our tortillas. We love our tacos. Um, there's uh, uh, all kinds of different history amongst why or, and reasons why um, our fan base does throw them. Um, it was a um, something that happened decades ago, and it just stuck. And um, there's been multiple times that uh, various athletic directors have said, "Nay, we're not going to do that anymore." And all it did was cause more to be thrown. And so it's a, it's a fun thing. If you are hit by one, please don't um, just fall over. It's not going to do anything to you. It's just a, a, a flower tortilla. Uh, obviously, Texas Tech alum Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl this weekend. How excited is the Lubbock community for oh Patrick to maybe win his second? Yeah, I tell you what, um, we we are very um, thankful that um, Patrick Mahomes not only played for Texas Tech University and, and what joy he brought to us while he was here, but he has just been a great ambassador for the university, for uh, many of the um, charities that are in our community, for our businesses that are here. Um, he's constantly coming back and being a part of uh, uh, of our university and of the Lubbock scene. And we can't um, say enough about what a great person he is. Obviously, a phenomenal athlete, but he just uh, he and his family have just been um, wonderful. And um, we can't think of anybody uh, more deserving to be in the Super Bowl than him. And we are super excited to be cheering for him this weekend. We'll let you go on these two final questions. Uh, November 18th, UCF at Texas Tech. Approximately, what can we expect weather-wise? Yeah, you're probably going to find that during the day, it's um, very beautiful. We might be kind of 75 or maybe 80 degrees, uh, possibly even in the upper 60s. Uh, and then once uh, it gets to the evening time and the, the sun sets, it'll cool on down. We might be in the upper 40s or low 50s at that point. Uh, definitely need to bring some different layers so that you can enjoy being outside all day long. And you'll find that you, your morning time is your, your, you've got extra layers on and, and your evening time you've got extra layers on. And then you're uh, discarding some of those jackets and sweaters during the day. Still waiting for flights to open up uh, in that time of the year. Direct flights from Orlando, do you know? The, I don't, we don't have any direct flights from Orlando. You're likely to fly directly to Dallas and then Dallas to Lubbock. But you, I think you also have a direct flight to Austin, and Austin has a direct flight to Lubbock as well. 
Uh, on the off chance that you're going to, to Denver um, uh, you're, or even Houston, there's also direct flights that come from both those cities as well. All right, final word from you. Give us that sales pitch. Why Lubbock? Well, uh, first of all, if you've never been to Texas, this is truly what you have ever envisioned about Texas. Um, obviously, we've got some urban areas, but if you want to enjoy um, a great college town that celebrates football, that enjoys um, uh, a great competition and um, treats uh, their, their college students uh, well and, and where we have a lot of fun, there's so many fun things to do. And I would just highly encourage your fan base to come uh, and, and see everything that West Texas has to offer right here in the capital. John Osborne, CEO of Visit Lubbock. We appreciate you being with us on Sons of UCF. We welcome you and the fan base to Orlando when there are games here. And uh, many of us look forward to visiting you this fall. Uh, we are excited about traveling down that way and competing with you all. Uh, I tell you, it's, it's fun to have you all in the conference and we are really excited about it. Thank you so much for joining it. And um, we're excited uh, to, to meet your fan base as well. All right. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Enjoy the night. Thanks. You too. All right, Adam. Tortillas and bread. <laughs> I like that whiskey part too. I saw Robert, I knew would be happy about that. I saw him make a message about uh, the whiskey scene. Yeah, in my vast research on Lubbock, I did read about the the dry period. So uh, I was happy to see that had been lifted. Uh, a couple of breweries. I looked one up, uh, Trace. Yeah, put this on your agenda. Two Docks Brewing Co. Looks like it uh, may be a hit for you. But I got to tell you, I need I need the, the credentials of this guy. I need the bona fides. I mean, Lubbock Lights, come on. Everybody knows about Lubbock Lights. I need, what's the what's the credentials to be the CEO of Visit Lubbock? Is there some sort of test you got to pass? I feel like I feel like we got a hoodwink there. Does he, uh, or maybe they don't want to sell themselves as a destination for uh, for the UFO scene. Uh, by the way, Georgia had taken a 3-2 lead over the Knights top of the six. Are you watching uh, that on so. TV? Has your, is your ESPN Plus back yet? And my ESPN Plus is back. Yes, oh, I'm, I, I'm still you got to kind yeah. of. You can, I find that you got to get out of it and then go back to it once it freezes up. It doesn't just oh, yeah. automatically reset. So uh, Georgia has taken a lead. Well, uh, we now know a little bit more about Lubbock. I think it's probably yeah. for your purposes. So here's mine, my problem. It's probably good that Mike is not here. I don't know. That Very Mike, true. Yes. I don't know that Mike would have been on his best. Mike was the first one to get banned from Lubbock without ever going to Lubbock. But yeah. here's what I, I'm, I'm concerned about safety because we had that kid on over the summer who told us <laughs> crime was on the rise in Lubbock. Right. But this guy basically told me like, hey, don't don't just don't, don't talk out loud. <laughs> don't ever speak. And you may be fine in Lubbock. And I'm not sure I'm OK with that. I don't, I don't know how to feel about that. Uh, it's an interesting thread, right? I, uh, I haven't really thought that uh, on other road trips. Uh, Thanks, Dolly. Be, I knew. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. Uh, before we uh, switch gears and move to another guest, Orlando Guardians with some news today. They released their 51-man roster heading into their uh, February 18th opener, and linebacker Terrence Plummer, the former Knight, uh, makes the roster. However, former UCF DB Antoine Collier cut. Uh, so uh, media availability with uh, Terrence. I'm hoping that I'll have opportunity to see him Saturday at Camping World Stadium. Uh, so uh, we got uh, derailed there when he was held in team meetings and haven't had opportunity to reschedule him on uh, on the Thursday show, but uh, may be able to catch up with him. Also, Adrian Killens, uh, who was drafted uh, by Houston, has uh, now part of the Arlington Renegades roster, their 51-man roster. I think Marcus Tatum made uh, San Antonio, but I didn't see their final uh, roster today. So a couple of nights uh, will be in the new XFL, and that's right around the corner. Are you uh, are you in on that, Trace? Are you going to games? What's your what's your status on, on the XFL? Uh, certainly interested in the opener and then just have to see. You know, mm. I mean, I have uh, season tickets to Orlando City Soccer, and then, of course, it's baseball and softball season, so you can't be everywhere. You know, and plus some work travel, personal travel cannot Ooh. be. Did we everywhere. did we give away those tickets we had? Or are those still available? Um, I have heard from everybody that I had enough tickets for. I need okay, to right. arrange them with the Guardians. So uh, I don't have any extras right now. I want to thank the, the folks that reached out to me. So I've given away uh, pairs of tickets for that. I've got your name and I may need your email address and what have you. And we'll get that finalized. And then uh, I'll get that to the Guardians who have been generous with uh, sending out some tickets. Yeah, I mean, look, football is football. I mean, you know, this gives these guys an opportunity to, you know, to get out there and play one more time. You never know when a guy will make a make a team. Um, Kevontae Turpin, uh, the USFL, was on the Dallas Cowboys this year. was just in the Pro Bowl. So you never know what can happen. 
I'm all about these leagues uh, once the Super Bowl is over. I know it's one of our mailbag questions where we get to predict uh, uh, the game. Uh, uh, and, and you mentioned uh, Patrick Mahomes there. Uh, Texas Tech, no doubt, going to be tuning in, Red Raider Nation. Uh, by the way, is it, have we added Texas Tech for you? Is that on your roster of possible places you're going to go? Or uh, do you remain uh, skeptical? I told someone today as I was talking about this phenomenon I can probably survive anywhere for 24 hours if it's centered around a football game, right? So if there's a football game that's going to take up the majority, majority of my day, I can I can survive anywhere. Part of where I differ a little from Mike is I've had to do a lot of really weird work travel. Um, so raise your hand if you've spent a week in Rustville, Arkansas. Yeah, this guy has. So I can pretty much <laughs> make it <laughs> a whole week. Trace. Also a Drow County, by the way, which is a really weird phenomenon. Um, I can figure it out for 24 hours around a football game. Am I going to go vacation in Lubbock anytime soon? Absolutely not. But if you're telling me 24 hours, fly in, fly out, see a game, hang out, have some fun, you know, watch football, watch UCF play, I can, I can figure that out, right? But I probably won't go back. Gotcha, gotcha. We've been uh, welcoming in uh, not only the uh, uh, CEO of uh, you know Visit Lubbock, but uh, some of our fellow podcast hosts. Yeah. Explain for folks that may not be aware, you talk a little bit about it on the podcast. We don't talk about it as much here. Uh, sure. The 1012 Network that the Sons of UCF are part of. Yeah, 1012 Network is a, a band of a podcasts that all um, each cover one specific team in the Big 12. Uh, and so we're kind of a, a dysfunctional family of shows that you can reach out to, ask questions to. Uh, we all obviously care and love the uh, the Big 12 scene. So, um, you know, it's it's just a network of shows that we're all a part of. And um, and we've brought on a few new shows here in the last couple of weeks, uh, one for Cincinnati, one for BYU. And tonight we are joined by uh, two individuals who have been running one of the longest uh, running college podcasts that I'm aware of, joined the, the uh, 1012 Network a long time ago. You may know them from the Scott and Holman podcast. We have Dustin and Sam are with us here tonight. So they're also fellow members of the um, the 1012 Network. We don't have to do the special handshake, fellas, but welcome to, uh, welcome to the Sons of UCF. <laughs> Hey, yeah, good to be talking to you and excited to be uh, part of uh, talking to another one of our uh, 1012 Network uh, hosts here. All right, we've got Dustin, we've got Sam. The show is what? The Scott and Holman podcast. So what's what's with the title of the show? Uh, so Scott and Holman are two of the uh, the major streets that uh, run through the campus U of H, one through Houston's historic third ward, run right past a lot of the, uh, the athletics uh, facilities there uh, on campus at U of H. Um, and then, so we just, we actually long ago, many, many moons ago, we, we had a Scott and Holman, we had a Scott and Holman blog that we did. Uh, and then it, we decided we didn't want to do the blogging thing anymore. Got some, uh, some podcasting equipment and became the Scott and Holman podcast with the PAW because we're big dorks who like, uh, animal puns and, uh, cougars have paws. So that is, that is the Scott and Holman podcast, uh, name in its entirety. How we long have you been doing the podcast? Uh, since August of 2015. We, wow. uh, we started pioneers Ser serendipitous. We, our kind of general idea was that at the time, and that was kind of our thoughts leading up to us. Okay. No one's doing a U of H podcast right now. We can't possibly do a worse job than nobody. Right. <laughs> and I think we've tested that, but I, I, I do think that it kind of helped us all early on that, you know, figuring out like, like we had written a fair amount to the two of us. Dustin kind of alluded to it, but we hadn't ever really spoken in front of a microphone. I think we thought it was a lot easier a process than it actually was, but uh, it's been it's been cool now to see it to eight seasons. It was a very serendipitous time that we did it because it ended up being right before our biggest football season in a couple decades and a pretty good period, obviously, for Cougar basketball as well. So, obviously, we feel like we've done a nice little job here this podcast, but we would acknowledge, the I think, the luck of the time that we decided to start doing a show about Cougar athletics. And then, of course, what's your reaction now? You at UCF, Cincinnati, BYU, going into the new look Big 12. you got to be happy. Join in with the Knights, right? Yeah, I think everyone uh, associated with the University of Houston is uh, is pretty over the moon about joining the Big 12 and certainly, um, you know, coming with uh, the teams that they're that coming with makes a lot of sense for uh, for those three schools as well as BYU, I think, uh, to all be joining. I think that it's, it was four smart moves by, uh, by the conference, uh, made the right reaction to uh, OU and UT leaving for the SEC. And it's, you know, like a lot of fan bases, I think I'm probably – I think four for four, if you ask any of the fan bases that are joining the Big 12, if, uh, you know, even five years ago when you weren't in a uh, power conference or whatever, do you still feel like you were a power conference team and deserve to be among that group? And I think it was, you know, four fan bases that all believe that they deserve their uh, their seat at the adults table, uh, so to speak. And 
And uh, to be getting it next year, to, I mean, just the recent, like having seen the uh, the football schedule, I didn't I didn't think I was going to get as excited as I did when I just saw that first Big 12 football schedule. I was like, holy crap, we're going to the Big 12. We're going to go play Big 12 football. We're going to join just this uh, insanely, you know, historically stacked uh, men's basketball conference as well as just, you know, a conference that's really good in every sport. So it's uh, really, really exciting and just very over the moon about it. Uh, you know, you get so few things in life that you just get to be, un, you know, I mean, you know, pretty much just excited with it with no reservations about. And that is, uh, I think, about how we feel about uh, going to the Big 12. Well, well I'd like to uh, get your action, Sam. I'll start with you. I don't know if you read the news that Oklahoma and Texas have negotiated their buyout. This will be their only year with the, the new four in the Big 12. They'll be gone in 2024. Sam, what's your reaction to only getting one year with, with OT, OU, at, uh, 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 Texas, and, and OU? I know you obviously play Texas at home, which is a nice benefit. But what's your reaction to only one year being in conference with those two schools? I think, frankly, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised and happy that we have one year or at least have a window to play those two teams. I think both of our general belief, at least until an official schedule came out, was, okay, we believe these two teams will play in a conference with U of H, UCF, Cincy, and company when we literally see a schedule for the coming season. Now that we've literally seen a schedule, it's okay. Like Now it's going to happen. And you, you've never seen, I think, in terms of historical precedent, a team do – like do the two seasons as a lame duck after the announcement they're moving to a different conference is happening. So I didn't expect we'd get two full seasons. I know all parties had to, you know, kind of put on a face of, yeah, like we have, you know, we have to make this happen. But I think, I think all of us really knew deep down that eventually those two departing schools would come up with the money and the, the networks would eventually get over whatever hurdles were on their end too, and just make this move happen. I don't think anyone at those two schools in the SEC wants to wait another 20 something months for that. I think vision for the conference come to fruition. And I think with the league knowing they're going to lose those two schools, you might as well get some money out of them now on the way out the door. So I think, I think it kind of actually this solution, I think it works nicely because we get a, a full season us as U of H going against a school that we know will just never deign to play us again in their life. It'd be, I would say it'd be very comparable to UCF, getting into a conference with the university of Florida for a year university of Florida. I just, I think finds UCF an existential threat in the same way that UT finds U of H an existential threat. And I think I'm just happy we're getting that one season and we're getting a little money for them leaving a little bit early out the door. Well, Dustin, I, the reason I want to have you both on was, you know, as we've been talking about our transition to uh, to the Big 12, you are doing the same as well. And I'm curious, kind of comparing apples to apples, as you as your school, as Houston prepares for that transition, what are some areas that you think Houston's doing really well where they think they're going to, you know, fit in nicely in the Big 12? And what are areas that you're concerned about their transition and where you think they may be behind in terms of being ready to hop in the Big 12 in this first year? Yeah, man, I think in terms of, of things that give me confidence about Houston moving in, I think just the way that they've been spending, you know, in, in years, even before they officially had the Big 12 invite, that they, they're just, you, you have a hard time finding an athletics facility that hasn't been either built or upgraded in the last, you know, several years. They, you know, they've gone out and whatever, you know, the football results on the field are, they, they dropped a whole lot of money on Dana Holgerson and his staff. Um, so they, they've been showing that they're not afraid to spend the kind of money that you have to spend. Uh, to compete in a conference like that and now getting a lot more money in every year you expect them to continue to uh, to spend like a team that not only is happy to be in the big 12 but actually wants to be successful there um and so i think i think that's really encouraging uh, i think the thing that scares me the most right now is maybe the football on the field product wasn't great last year and we're going heck walking into a uh you know meat grinder of a conference so uh just i feel like there's a, you know not terrible chance that houston goes you know three and nine four and eight something like that next year and uh, a whole lot of fans just kind of uh, freak out and and i mean it's you know, I, I think even a best case scenario is you know this football team you know winning six or seven games for the, for the first couple of years in the big 12 that would be a huge success and i i think that Houston fans being what they are, it's going to be hard to to keep people excited so my my only real concern is just with the programs that are going to need some time to get up to speed realistically you know is there going to be a uh, the, the you know the, the loss of uh, of interested fans from uh, i think if we're being honest very fairly uh, fickle sports city you uh you mentioned the uh the upgrades and facilities and, and things like that uh, head coach dana holgerson was recently quoted talking about how houston will be really at the bottom uh, in terms of revenue streams. How did you take his comments? Uh, I know he's trying to light a fire under the donor base, the alumni base. 
Uh, how did his uh, comments uh, come across to you and how do you think they were received? I think me, I think how they were received, I think uh, not positively. Uh, I can only speak for myself and say, I can separate my mm -hmm. dissatisfaction to some degree with the on-field football product with, I, I would say it's not wrong. I think acknowledgement of where U of H is in terms of program infrastructure compared to a, a, pro, a conference that has a number of teams that have been getting that power five money for a lot longer than the university of Houston. There's still a wide gulf between being kind of what Dustin said, a high spending group of five program and being able to spend what you're spending. If you're a big 12 team and you've been getting the media rights money that you've been getting for the last 20 something years that you've been part of some level of power conference there. So I, I don't disagree necessarily with him acknowledging that U of H has a long way to go in terms of program infrastructure. I think it does beg the bigger question though of, okay, you do eventually have to put this infrastructure in place and you do have to, if you're a big money donor, acknowledge that a program is more than this coach, that you're, you're donating for something that is going to have a lot longer shelf life as much as, as much as Dana has a cost prohibitive buyout for the next few years. You're donating for something that's going to span well beyond that time period. And that's all I think the fan base should look at it. I don't, I think the fan base should separate the dissatisfaction with how the 2022 season went and maybe some, I think personal, I, I guess not, not loving uh, Dana's deal, uh, Dana's personality, what Dana, Dana does generally. I think you should separate that from an honest acknowledgement of uh, the distance this program has to go infrastructure wise to be competitive. Yes, you could bring in a coach that maybe you're a bit happier with as the media in Houston fan, but whether that coach has the same issues Dana does, they're still going to be working behind, uh, even with all things that University of Houston is going for, I think, compared to your average Big 12 football program. Considering the success men's basketball has had of late, is Houston a football school first or a basketball school first? Uh, I mean, I think at, at, you'd have to say that that uh, that they're a basketball school just in terms of the uh, the program history is is stronger with the basketball program and the current uh, product is significantly stronger with the men's basketball program. But, you know, I think it's kind of a men's basketball school in a, in a football state where, you know, just this, the fan base at large, and it doesn't matter what the history is, you know, is if you, if you, if you could offer, you know, you know, 10,000 Cougar fans, a national championship in football or in men's basketball, I think you'd, you'd not get that many that would, uh, that would pick the hoops um, just because that's, that's the way the football is in the state. But I mean, I, I think at this point you've seen the fan base, seriously buy into uh to the men's basketball program when they renovated that arena they actually took a few seats out so it went from uh over eight thousand to over seven thousand seats in the arena and just like sure i mean we can't get half we can get that we can't get that arena half full so like why why would we make it any larger than that and now it just when this team is selling out wednesday night games against tulsa and you're just like oh and we're you're about to move to this conference with this this insanely stacked basketball conference maybe we should have put some more seats in that basketball arena so I, it's, it's going to be an awfully hot ticket i'm glad i've got my season tickets in already but uh it, yeah no it's it, it's a program that looks ready to go and out of all the things we're excited about for the uh the move to the big 12 i mean watching u of h compete in a conference with kansas and baylor and texas tech and and all the pro iowa state all the programs in the other uh, big 12 that is right at the top of the list Sam, 23 and 2 right now, the basketball team is a, a 2021 Final Four team. Is it Final Four or bust for this team? Is that the expectation level now, just based on how good they've been playing this year? I think this team definitely should have second and third week in expectations on them. I always say it's hard to judge a full 30 something game season on a single elimination tournament. You could have, you know, Virginia uh, several years ago was a legitimately very good team that just. Uh, pick the absolute worst uh, day of the, of the calendar to have a uh, awful game of uh, basketball. So uh, acknowledging the volatility of the NCAA tournament, I, I do think this team with the talent, with what they've done in 20 something games so far, I think should have that second or third weekend of the tournament expectations. But again, you might get a team that matches up really badly with you as good as this team has been as much as this team is very worthwhile of the low number next to their name. This team, I think like, all 360 something other division one basketball teams to some extent has their flaws. Does it have a lot less flaws than the vast majority of college basketball? Absolutely. But I think, I think this team should be among the last several standing when it's all said and done, just because of what they've done this year, what they have on the roster talent wise, what Kelvin Sams has proven he can do here in terms of getting a, uh, a good on court product. But you have to always acknowledge that the NCAA tournament, like 
one bad couple hours and that's your entire season. That's kind of the lens that your entire season is judged on. So I think always got to acknowledge that volatility, but yeah, this, this should be among the last several teams standing. You guys Dustin, battled the oh, go ahead. Adam. Uh, Dustin, we just saw UCF here. Our AD and VP Terry Mahajer just came out and publicly started um, sort of promoting the NIL community around UCF and some of the collectives that are there. How has Houston handled NIL and, and what sort of support or what sort of uh, information are the actual coaches and ministers giving fans about what to do with NIL stuff? Yeah, it's been a little bit, um, I think, slow to uh, to get the train rolling, uh, so to speak. In that, I, I think U of H, like like some schools uh, that that don't have the you know quite you know the wealth of uh, of big money boosters that some of the SEC programs and the like have. Um, so I, I think it, it took it it was and just it was real noticeable at first for the first year or so when it was just kind of like you'd have individual little businesses that would like you know that would hire a guy here or there. Uh, but it didn't really become the uh, the kind of collective, you know, large scale movement that it needs to be to remain competitive in, uh, in big time college athletics. Um, but we've seen that in the, in the last several months that that's that's been changing. You've seen a couple of uh, of NIL collectives come out, and you know, one le- led by uh, Landon Gosling, who was the uh, former uh, men's basketball player and like kind of fan favorite walk on type of guy, and uh, and he and he's kind of leading one of those efforts. And and you're seeing a lot more money from you know local business people being directed to that uh, that effort. So. Uh, I, I think Houston again. I, I don't know where if you if you ranked everyone's NIL, I would guess we're, we'd probably be in the bottom half of the Big Twelve right now, maybe towards the bottom half. But I, I think it's a trend that's moving in the right direction, at least. And at the very least, we've seen kind of the school and the coaches and the administrators, um, you know, willing to to kind of officially step up and endorse that those kind of moves and, and make sure that Houston remains competitive. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is just that, and you've seen it on a two pronged front. You've seen both people looking at, you know, kind of the individual personal NIL collectives and also the one Dustin referred to, Lincoln Cougs uh, by Landon Gosling, really uh, going after the Houston business community and getting a lot of, a lot of big name local businesses to uh, put their money behind Cougar men's basketball, especially. Considering the cultural fit that you guys are, you mentioned the, the schools that are in the Big 12. Do you think of UCF as a rival? I don't think we played you guys enough to be a rival because it was never really a consi- certainly not when we both went from Conference USA to American. I mean, we've had some good games. We, we've had some kind of maybe rivalry breeding kind of games. Really, a couple of close ones in 2013 and 14, and a couple of close ones following that in 2015 and 16. But I don't know. I just don't know if we've seen each other enough. You know, like we, when we played in 2019, not that I didn't uh, watch that game, but uh, Dust and I both went into that game in 2019, the football one, uh, with very limited expectations for what that first year team under Dana Holgerson could do. So, and the 2015 game where that was the last year kind of bombed down under George O'Leary, that wasn't really two programs seeing each other kind of at the same kind of rising moment. I, I think when UCF really kind of picked it up the end of Scott Frost, beginning of Josh Heupel, I think that was kind of when we were going into our slide uh, under major Apple and kind of Dana Holgerson inheriting uh, a bit of that. So, I don't know. We have some shared history, but I don't know if I would uh, use the word rivalry just again because of the ge- geographic distance and also just because I think we missed each other a lot in football. I say I don't know if I would say rival, but I've said many times, I'm sure Sam has heard me say this on multiple occasions. The UCF is the most similar school that exists to the University of Houston. The, 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 if, if you're looking for uh, a good comparison that even you know, years will go before we were going to the Big 12 together, I've said that just in terms of being in a, a major metro, having kind of a larger enrollment than people realize, um, having you know done a lot more and you know at the, the mid-major level and kind of been held back by you know the, the interests of larger schools in the conference and just very much a, a thorn in the paw of the other larger schools in, uh, in the conference, so to speak. So uh, I, I think there's, you know, a, a shared kind of like, I, you know, and I've, I've talked to other Cougar fans and gotten kind of a similar reaction that, that I think there's a shared kind of realize we're kind of looking at across each other in the mirror a little bit when we see the, when we see UCF. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's a school that, you know, we there's enough shared history that I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, you get one or two uh, real heated uh, football matchups here in, in the big 12. And, and suddenly I think that it has the potential. I think there's enough there. It could maybe, uh, maybe build into uh, butt into more of a rivalry than it currently is. And we'll end with this earlier. We had the CEO of Visit Lubbock on. Have you been to Lubbock? And do you recommend it? If so, let me tell you guys a story here. Uh, Dust, we actually, Dust and I have off and on again over our lives been roommates here. Uh, we both lived in a part of Central Texas uh, before I moved out to uh, beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. But anyway, so we played Texas Tech in 2018. It's about an eight nine eight nine ish, right, Dustin? Our drive from where we were previously to Lubbock. We were kind of in the central part of Texas, and Lubbock is just way up kind of in the panhandle and we 
traveled out there uh, to see U of H get a Texas Tech passing record <clears throat> set on us in a 63-49 loss. And Texas Tech, as you gentlemen probably know, is a team that is synonymous with throwing the ball a lot. So if Texas Tech sets a passing record against you, you are having a really bad day. We were having a really bad day. Uh, and we got to drive 16 hours in one weekend for the privilege of being in just uh, what I would say, certainly tied with East Texas as the least appealing part of the state to spend uh, any amount of extended time. Uh, I would I would generally uh, avoid ever visiting that part of Texas unless I was driving through it uh, very quickly uh, and not stopping. And, and that's not even like a, a rural thing because there's parts of West Texas that I will tell are absolutely gorgeous, some of the most beautiful places you'll see big bend kind of uh guadalupe mountain thereabouts but uh it rains literal manure sometimes there which i think kind of says uh, all you need to really have said about the livability of that part of the state like i heard i, I heard one of you uh, guys earlier mention that i can travel anywhere for a short period of time you could you could do a decent day or two like in lubbock around a football game there's some college town stuff there uh i I personally, Dustin, I, th- I think found Texas Tech fans fairly agreeable in person. We were there. Uh, but if I had to spend any more time than that or not oriented around a sporting event, I think I would slowly lose my mind. Well, that's a, a good way to cap the uh, yeah. bookends that were the CEO of Visit Lubbock and uh, Dustin and Sam from the Scott and Holman podcast. Guys, we appreciate you being part of the 1012 network with the Sons of UCF. And we hope to talk with you again soon. Hey, thanks, thanks for having us. Guys. Thanks, fellas. All right, Adam, I'm not sure they're, they're sold <laughs> on Lubbock. More points for Lubbock. <laughs> yeah, more points for Lubbock. Uh, top of the seventh, Georgia now leading UCF 4-2. Uh, however, better news, men's basketball snapped its five-game losing streak. And of all places, Wichita, where the Knights had never won, 72-67 over the Shockers. That may be our first, our next, our last one in Kansas Trace for a long time. <laughs> so we might want to enjoy this one all we got it. Yeah, are you suggesting that basketball <laughs> may not win? I'm, I'm not just suggesting Kansas, it. I'm stating it as a fact. <laughs> Kansas State, yeah. uh, Taylor Hendricks, team high, 23 points. Uh, we are running late on this show, but there's always time for our guy, Leo Rodriguez, who hops on now. Leo, Taylor Hendricks, team high, 23 points. I don't mean to question head coach Johnny Dawkins, but you just got to keep giving Taylor the ball, don't you? You have to. You have to. You have to keep feeding him the ball. He's obviously the best player on the floor at all times. Uh, we got some shooters on the team. No, you know, that's with all due respect to guys like Ethel Horde and, and CJ Kelly. But Taylor Hendricks, uh, he's got to get utilized a bit more. Um, you can also see that his minutes and, and, you know, they're increasing, obviously, you know, being a freshman this year, um, it, can, it can get to him. But he's getting used to it, I think. And, um, uh, I think Coach Jockins is realizing that, and he's coming into his own, I, I would say. Leo, I'm going to utter a statement I never thought I'd say out loud. I miss Michael Durr. <laughs> when is he coming back? <laughs> Any update on his injury? You know, I was uh, I was actually thinking about that before I got on here. You know, uh, there's no statement on Michael Durr's uh, availability moving forward. Uh, the only thing that we've gotten so far from Coach Dawkins is that he is expected to be back before the end of the season. Um, now there is a gray area there because so was UCF the season, Mike at this point, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> there is a gray area there because, as you know, end of the season could be at the end of the regular season. Tomorrow it seems like right. Yes, it could be at the end of the turn at the end of the conference tournament. It could be you know if we get a, a invitational to you know maybe the NIT or you know any other um, uh, basketball tournament. You know when is it exactly that he's going to be available? It's concerning because. With the state of what they are now, um, he could he could definitely be used. Um, you know, Michael Durr, obviously, he's not going to be the best player on the court, but he is a body that's there in this in the paint, and uh, we miss that. We miss that dearly, and I hope he's back way before you know the end of the season, as Coach Dawkins is implying. But um, we'll see. We'll see what uh what, when he comes back. I'm not sure the Kingdom uh, Collective is going to be hiring Leo. He's a body. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Tulsa comes to town now on Saturday night. Big block party out by the arena. Uh, Tulsa loses at Houston last night, 80 to 42. Uh, We'll end with this, Leo. What do you want to see more of besides Taylor Hendricks on Saturday against the Golden Hurricane? Well, I thought we were rebounding the basketball pretty good for quite a while. I mean, our defense was one of the best in the country in the first half of the season. I want to see us get back to that. 
that's got to be our, our, our blueprint moving forward if we want to have a chance at uh, winning games and continuing to win games. So uh, definitely the defense has to show up again. Um, I You know, best three-point shooting team in the conference, that's something to be proud of. And I, I would say getting over those little humps that Coach Dawkins keeps talking about in the press conferences, like he mentioned after the Wichita State game, hey, we got over the hump. We need to keep doing that in the continuing games. That way we can see these type of results because there's no reason we should be uh, losing to a Wichita State team that's uh, struggling mightily this season. And uh, Tulsa, I think, you know, is a, is, a, is an opponent we could put to bed on Saturday, but um, we have to be able to get over the hump and get back to our defensive capabilities that we were uh, showing at the beginning of the season. So the Knights held uh... – Wichita under 70. That's the that's the key stat. Watch for yeah, that. You out there Saturday, Leo? Yes, I will be out there. So All right. He's more than just a body filling in on the Sons of UCF. He is Leo Rodriguez. Leo, I'll see you out at the arena on Saturday. All right. See you guys. Thanks, Leo. All right. Leo stories you'll find on Sons of UCF YouTube channel. Expect more previews uh, from our friend John Weiss on twonightsmedia.com. Space game on Saturday. They're Try not all that not nonsense, uh, the new uniform. Uh, oh, those are nice unis, Trace. Get over it. Come on. Yeah. And Tell then Thursday, uh, can we make a programming decision? Uh, Thursday, February 16th, they're at Memphis, 8 o'clock. Uh, usually we move around, which can yeah. be difficult. Uh, how about 7 o'clock? You okay with 7 o'clock? You're talking to me or everybody else? Uh, well, I'm t primarily talking to you. <laughs> okay. I can do 7. I'm, I'm in for 7. Okay. Uh, we go to the bottom of the seventh, uh, Georgia leading UCF 4-2. Uh, I asked on uh, my Twitter poll question this week, will UCF softball, you know, the defending AAC champions uh, made it to the Super Regional last year, be the first Knights program to win a Big 12 Conference Championship? 73% said yes, uh, that they they will be. Um, how'd you vote? I voted no. If it's not them, who? I don't know. Big 12 softball is tough. I mean, uh, Oklahoma. But they're losing Oklahoma after this year, right? Oklahoma Texas. State is, a, is a, another good program. Um, it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough league. So I'm not quite sure in year one, um, year two, maybe they have options. I, 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 does cheerleading have a Big 12? Because that's that's where I wanted to vote. I don't know if there's some sort of a cheer and dance competition. I feel like we'd own that though. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, earlier, there was a media day. You'll find all of those uh, interviews and such on the Suns YouTube channel. And I spoke with first baseman Shannon Doherty. She believes the Knights can be a force this season. This team's strengths, I think, is really our athleticism. This is one of the most talented, skilled teams I've ever been a part of. Like, softball IQ is through the roof. Uh, we, we have some newcomers coming in that are extremely experienced, extremely talented, and I think they're going to make waves. Friday, February 12th against UMass at 4, Boise State in the evening at 6.30. Saturday, they've got Ohio State at 5, so you can catch that before men's basketball at 7. A lot going on out at the campus. And then Wednesday, they welcome in currently 23rd-ranked Missouri at 6 o'clock at the Plex. So uh, UCF certainly scheduling uh, tough right off the top uh, here. Around the kingdom, women's basketball, they snap uh, a four-game losing streak. They won 60-57 at Cincinnati. They've got... Uh, Memphis. They're at Memphis on uh, Saturday at three o'clock, and then Wednesday they welcome in the cows, who are doing pretty well. So that's going to be some tough more high four points. Uh, and um, keep monitoring softball, see if they can mount a comeback. Of course, last year it went extra innings uh, in the Shannon Doherty walk off over Georgia. So let's see if the Knights have some magic in the uh, the bottom of this frame. All right, mailbag time. Wait, are we? Uh, let's go. Let's go with the original. It's that time again. Let's open the Brian W. Peterson. Sons of UCF mailbag. And before we do, Trace, I've got to give a shameless plug to Brian David Peterson, who um, was instrumental in helping us at the Sons of UCF get our taxes figured out for this year. What does a used Brian, car salesman know about taxes? He knows a bunch, by the way, because he knew every answer to every question I had. He helped me get forms figured out. If anybody out there is literally looking for tax advice, this is your time. Brian Peterson may be the nicest human on earth. He answered all my questions. He actually followed up and made sure I didn't have any more questions. Who does that these days? Um, Peterson Accounting is where you find Brian. Uh, shameless plug, free plug for Brian. He is uh, he was a fantastic resource. It's tax season. Keep Brian busy. If he's busy, he can't join the show. I'm thinking ahead. So give him more <laughs> of your tax opportunities. You'll see less of Brian, huh? Uh, Brian is a good sport, a great follow, and a great supporter of the Sons of UCF. He may or may not have been the first subscriber of the Sons YouTube channel. That was unclear. Uh, <laughs> unclear. Thanks, everybody. 
uh, who has hopped on board the last week. We're getting closer to that thousand, and um, I appreciate all of that. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to see we're, we're not above begging. I like that, Chris. <laughs> I just put that plea out because I tell you, I, I, I bent to you. I'm obsessed with it. We got to get to that number, and then yes, yes. Yeah, put out that plea. Uh, our friends at the 1012 Network, given the Twitter feud that's begun between UCF and other Big 12 fans, what's something about UCF current Big 12 fans should be excited about? It's an interesting question. What's what's something that you should be I think excited about? We're good for your engagement. That's for darn sure. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get your Twitter numbers up. I think you'll see a heavy number of UCF fans travel to games. I think that'll make games more exciting. I think we'll be in the parking lots. We'll be in your bars. We'll be in your stadiums. Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more UCF people around than people really think. I think these Twitter polls are getting a lot of attention, and there's accusations of bots and all this other nonsense. But I think they're going to see a lot of fans are going to travel big to UCF games, and I think that'll make those at, those atmospheres more exciting. So I think they're they're in for an awakening when they see how many black and gold colored uniforms and shirts and hats come rolling through their gates. I think fans are also going to be surprised when they visit uh, the UCF campus, just how much is going on uh, now. What kind of welcome you get uh, by Night Nation, I'm not sure, but I think you're going to be surprised by the, uh, the facilities and the game day atmosphere at Hugh C. Half. It's been 18 months since Terry Mahajer, his anniversary, by the way, uh, two-year anniversary yes. as AD, since uh, Mahajer 18 months ago announced his plan to upgrade the football complex, aside from picking the design for no updates. Why? Money. Money. Did he pick? Did he actually pick the design firm? Um, I don't know. I think they had some sketches, which they've revised. Yeah. It has been quiet on that front, and I can see no other reason except money. I think it's also a reprioritization of what their what their efforts were. I think eighteen months ago, NIL wasn't necessarily this this thing that it is now. I think Terry's got to figure out how to reprioritize what he wants. Uh, there's there's talk of Roth Tower needing a serious facelift. So. Yeah. I think there was a lot of, hey, look at us. We're going to do all these great things just to sort of show. But I think when you get down to brass tacks, a.k.a. Brian W. Peterson, I think now now you realize what really has to be done. A couple of questions about uh, the uh, the Pac-12 schools. At Spursy Night, if the rumors of the Big 12 taking some Pac-12 teams are true, what are your top three? And at UCF, uh, CEO Guy 0218, what do you guys think of the possibility of SMU and San Diego State joining uh, the Pac-12? Um I still like that. Uh, he said three. Spursy Knight said three. But I like that whole Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State, Utah. Uh, I like that. And, and, you know, I'm not wishing the demise of the AAC, just the demise of the team over in Tampa. And if it benefits uh, SMU and San Diego State, good for them. Yeah, that just feels like down bad behavior by the Pac-12. I would like to see Air the Arizona schools in Utah. Uh, no Colorado, if you only had three. No, because I think Dion's going to actually build that thing into a good program. So I want to st- I want to wait till he's gone, and then we'll we'll bring Colorado in. At Cap Veach one, how long before the Big Twelve teams run through the self proclaimed national championship smack? That's going to happen for the rest of time. Uh, it's already I, happened, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, I think that. I don't see it slowing down. That cuts both ways for UCF. UCF has become rebellious uh, defending that. Uh, it's uh, get, it's just going to happen. Just yeah, well, look, if you, if you don't know UCF and you need to insult, there's like the, in case of emergency, break glass option. Now, option one is national championship. Option two is you went on, you didn't win a game in 2015, right? Twice. You know, those are the two main go-tos. Whenever you need to break glass and insult a UCF person on Twitter, those are the go-tos every time. At Black Gold Guido, always good to send us questions. He thinks Boise would be a top 25 preseason team, which is interesting. Does UCF have to play one P5 and or a top 25 G5 in future schedules to bolster their strength of schedule? I think the Big 12 schedule is strong enough. Uh, I don't. I think there's going to be one marquee game there. Yeah, I think uh, what the scheduling model I think is um, to play at least one Power Five school, um, one G5 school, um, or is it two Power Five schools and one G5 school? I think is what the uh, the Big 12 wants you to do. I think I agree with you, Chase. I think we'll have plenty of uh, ranking point fodder available to us in the uh, in the Big 12. By the way, the, I thought it was interesting from the podcast folks that they say six and six, seven and five. Uh, you know, so they've got their sights set the right way, as, as Night Nation is talking about for UCF. Uh, Brian Peterson, are you happy or disappointed with where the uh, football recruiting transfer classes ended up in comparison to the other Big 12? Uh, on paper, at least, uh, it seems promising. I'd call it promising in a transitional year, I think, uh, and you see it with the number of transfers that uh, are making hay for UCF softball, that this is going to remain that transfer destination. But you need those high school kids, and then you got to retain them. I think. Gus and the other coaches and uh, across UCF have got to find that right balance. I'd say promising uh, and going into the Big 12, I'm fine with where they were. 
I think the framework is it makes a lot of sense, right? I think they went after a lot of local kids and kept them at home, which is which is important. I think in the portal they fill positions of need. Um, the recruiting ranking stuff is really just a mathematical formula. So the less you have, the the lower your scores are. But if you do average rank per recruit, I think UCF was in the top two or three um, in the uh, in the Big Twelve and and top forty five ish maybe in the country. So I think that's a better indicator of where we are. But we'll see if they're any good. But I think the framework is is a good start for year one. Emptiness his floor while Gus may have given a play calling. Do you think he'll still slip in some plays here or there? Yes. Yes. I, I, so I don't think he gave a play call. I think he will um, concepts and um, schemes. I think you'll absolutely see Gus have his hand on. I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to run a bunch set here, uh, Darren. Uh, what do you think? Like, and I think Darren will then draw up three guys in a bunch set. Like, I don't, I don't know how much he's really going to remove his his thumper, particularly if things don't go well. If things are are running good, maybe. But if we have some stumbles early on offensively. Gus is going to be itching to get back into that uh, that quarterback room. At Unger to Unger, Sam asking, would you rather a former Cows player lead your NFL team to a Super Bowl win or a former UCF player choke in the Super Bowl to give your NFL team the Super Bowl win? It's a lot of things right there. So either way, my Super Bowl team wins, if I read that correctly. So then it comes down to, do I want a Cow fan or Cow person happy or a UCF guy upset? I guess I'd rather not upset a UCF guy if I can avoid it. So I'll take one happy Cow guy for a day if my NFL team wins and save my UCF brethren a, uh, an embarrassing night. What's good for you is you're a Cowboys fan, so you don't really have to actively consider this. No, I don't have to worry about this at all. No, ever. And also, what's good for me is there's no way a cow is ever leading anyone to a Super Bowl, so we don't have to worry about that anytime soon. At uh, Rejoice Nights, Joyce, thank you for the very nice comments on social media. She's saying predict the men's record uh, for the end of the season. I, I think they still hit that 20 win mark. Uh, and it may take a tournament uh, win or two. I think they've got Tulsa. That should be a win. Memphis is going to be tough. They welcome in the cows. I think there'll be revenge at home. Um, so I, th- I think they I think they hit that 20 wins. Whether that makes anybody happy or not, I don't know. Uh, I got 18 and 12 and uh, losing in the first round of the conference tournament. So 18, 13. Mm. At Deportes Man 85, this may be the first uh, such question we've gotten. A golf question <laughs> yes. is Anna Nordfors, the best transfer to play for UCF in the 2022-23 academic year. I think it's too soon to say, but she's already setting records. Uh, Full uh, transparency. Yeah. I had to look up who that was. <laughs> Secondly, once I figured it out, uh, obviously on, on, the, on the women's golf team, shot a 64-63 back-to-back. But here's the thing, Trace. They only finished fourth in that tournament. As my, I'll channel my inner mic, do it in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. You know, win the thing, and then we can talk. You know what I'm saying? At Patrick Nurse, FTW for the win. How seriously should we take all the ire we've been receiving lately from the Big 12 fan bases? Should night fans be concerned with traveling to away games just to Lubbock, apparently? Yes. <laughs> Careful what you say. I think that UCF fans, uh, you know, we're used to bumping a little bit with Miami, Florida State, and Florida, but I think it's going to be a little bit of a different thing when you're in Norman, Oklahoma. By the way, softball official uh, 4-2 Georgia with the uh, with the victory. Um I, look, I think fellow knights, if you're if you're together in groups, I think the majority of people are going to be welcoming. They're going to see you, right? You'll probably get a little 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 little, little middle finger situation here and there, but I, I think the majority of people are going to be welcoming, just like we hopefully would be when they show up at UCF. Sure, we're going to yell at them, get, you know, go back to Lubbock, right? Whatever. But if some guy comes over and wants to talk, I'll buy a bag of bread and feed. Wants to wants to talk <laughs> prairie dogs with you. You know what I'm saying? You you, you welcome him to your tailgate. You know. Uh, at Free Sport Travel, are you and UCF Mike still friends? What is that about? What is that about? Is it Who's that directed to? Is that you? I think it was directed, it was directed yeah. at me because I said that uh, Mike just uh, runs his mouth a lot about these uh, these cities and, and they're good college towns that have passionate fans. And we uh, we differ in that. I don't have a problem going to Lubbock, but of course, yeah, we're still friends. When are uh, we have an auditions for his spot on the show? He's not <laughs> no, no, there. don't do that, yeah. Trace. No, Mike is a valued member of the Suns of UCF. He's been he's been on assignment doing some stuff with his with his work and his, his career and whatnot. So okay. he will be back. I think uh, next week. I haven't talked to him. I think next week. Uh, at Ethan of 126, if you had to drop Mike off in any Big 12 city, <laughs> which would it be and why? <laughs> it's Lubbock, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I have known I have known my good friend Michael for over 25 years. I cannot do this to him. I will drop him off in Fort Worth, which I think is the biggest metro city available to him. I think if he did some of that uh, cruising, sailgating, he might actually like Waco for the weekend. Oh, when you see a place. I, I mean, I've seen that river on on picture. It doesn't sound like it's it's up to my quality. At uh, Dolly underscore drama. What do you have in the Super Bowl? Eagles. Um, I can't root for the Eagles. It's literally against my religion. So I'm going to go with the, uh, the chiefs. Did Brian really ask his 
coach Sidney Ball below. <laughs> <laughs> JP, the agenda spreads. Uh, Church, the agenda spreads. At uh, UCF. Actually, you. I'm sorry, you skipped Dolly's question. He actually asked what my Super Bowl side dish or snack oh, are. Yeah, yeah I just and I do want to. I do want to talk about this. I am making my uh, my famous pico de gallo for the game, so I can't I can't wait to get in the kitchen late Saturday, make some colorful, flavorful pico, yeah, let it marinate overnight there, and that's my uh, Super Bowl game snacks, so pico de gallo. No po boys. <laughs> we don't do cow of the week on this show, Trace. If we did, it may be me for having seafood at the most inland restaurant you can find. By the way, everybody, avoid the po boy sandwich at Walk Ons in Vieira. Trust me. <laughs> At UCF underscore Jeb Shred, our buddy. Uh, last year, Coach Malzahn's team motto was seize the moment. Uh, how'd that turn out? What should it be this upcoming season? Just win six. <laughs> Got two. Um, may the bridges I burn light the way. Um, oh, and, wow, the, uh, <laughs> and the other one I is... I on a t-shirt. <laughs> the other one is prove them wrong. Prove them wrong. I'm going to be snarky and say just win six. All right. All right, guys. We ran a little bit late. Uh, we want to thank John Osborne, uh, CEO of Visit Lubbock. We had Dustin Rensink and Sam Raz from the Scott and Holman podcast. Of course, Leo Rodriguez stopping by, talk a little men's basketball with us. We miss UCF, Mike. We hope you enjoy uh, the Super Bowl weekend. Remember, seven o'clock will be on next week before men's basketball at Memphis. Uh, and for Adam, I'm Trace Trolko. Go Knights, everyone! Yeah, we've got some new uh, new videos, Trace. I know you went out and you, you shot some videos. You don't have so Destiny gotta... anymore? You don't... <laughs> I still Destiny. do if you, want, if you want to roll that no, one no, back. No, no. But I know we've got some new ones, so we will sign off. But this person says goodbye. Hi, I'm Coach Bear, and thanks for watching the Sons of UCF.